are okay with standing up. Could you stand up, please? And I'm going to hit the music in just a second. When people hear the word mind-body medicine, they think, oh, yeah, it's all about sitting and contemplating my navel and breathing deeply and being serene. Well, it isn't always all about that. There's an exercise that we do uh, with everyone we work with all over the world that is called shaking and dancing. We're not going to dance. Um, people freak out. And besides, this isn't a, a really good venue for dancing. But we're going to shake just for a minute. You've all been sitting there being an excellent audience to these fantastic talks. And so I want you to just, we're going to shake it up just a little bit, all right? Just for maybe a minute, OK? And we're going to do it to some really awesome, inspiring shaking music. And how do you shake, you may ask. I'm going to tuck this in, OK? All right, ready? That's how you shake. <laughs> OK. Um, the music will start. I'm going to encourage you. And then uh, we'll stop. OK, ready? Shake. Ah, it's really good. Noise is good. OK, you can, if you just want to shake your hand, shake your hand. I think it, shaking is good when it starts here. Shake your money maker. Shake it, shake it, shake it. Shake it. OK. And now. Ha! Yeah! Ha! Ha! One more! Ha! Okay. Now I want you to just hold it, turn off the music. Feel that for a minute. Then we're gonna do four Qigong breaths and inhale. And then just breathe it out. One more. And now. You might be like, but whatever works, right? And then the last one, we'll bring it up. And then back to our hearts. OK, when you're ready, you can sit down. OK. You can do that in your office, in the bathroom, <laughs> at your office, um, at the, in your home. Not in your car, probably. But it's a, it's a portable and powerful way to shift the energy that's inside you. So I'm going to talk to you about mind-body medicine in the 21st century. And I'm Claire Wheeler. I am a former emergency medicine doctor, a clinical psychologist. And I, but my true love, really, since the first day I walked into a classroom here at PSU um, in 2005, it was kind of a hobby. Uh, Leslie McBride called me up and said, Claire, why don't you come teach some, a class on disease? I'm like, oh, that might be fun. And I walked in, and I saw these faces, and, and I guess it was my inner ham. You know, it was, I belong here. This is what I want to do. I love seeing the faces of my students as we go through the term and seeing how those expressions change. And I love teaching what I teach because it's personal and it's global and it's everything in between. And so I want to talk to you about the 20th century and my, my story and how it connects really with the paradigm shift that we've been going through in terms of medicine and just how we can be human every single day. As a synthesis, I have to say, um, the science and the art and the humor, the way we bring our humanity into space, and the way we are all creative but maybe need to find a way to do that in the world, to me, those two talks were a wonderful lead into what I'm talking about now. I decided to become a doctor because I spent a lot of time at Boston Children's Hospital when I was a little kid uh, as a patient. And I had a couple major surgeries and lots of checkups and follow-ups and things like that. And thanks to my parents, um, who lived a couple hundred miles away, they made sure that I went to a really good place for the treatments I needed. So I thought that doctors were wizards, magicians, and that medicine was just a series of fantastic, almost incomprehensible procedures and knowledge, and, and the doctors would make their rounds in their white coats and always make me feel so special. Um, and that's what I wanted to do with my life. So I thought that I would be this kind of doctor. Um, 
And so I went, uh, went to college, went to Berkeley, got very, very into science. Um, and I, in the back of your mind, those of you who are students and are pre-med, every day you think, oh, what if I don't get in? What will I do? Well, my, my choice was I was going to be a scientist. So I've always been an absolute uh, devotee of the scientific method and what we can do. I mean, the phenomenal things we can do with our minds if we are, if we are educated mathematically and in the sciences. So I did research on glucocorticoid mediated differentiation of human neuroblastoma cells and culture and wrote my thesis at Berkeley on a typewriter. <laughs> Oh my God. And we had to do Fourier transforms. I'm not sure what that is, but it's a math thing to count <laughs> receptors on these cells. And, but what's interesting to me is I, I am now an expert in stress and trauma, and glucocorticoids are the type of steroids that are involved in the stress response. Somehow everything fits together. Meanwhile, this was back in the 80s, meanwhile, there was this whole new revolution happening in our ideas about what, how do we get sick and how do we get well and what do we do about it. And back in the 80s, that was also the advent of the AIDS pandemic and also managed health care. When, when I say the word health care, what do most people think of? They think of surgery, medications, Medicare, Obamacare, <laughs> and all of these things. When I think of health care, I think about what every one of us does from the moment you wake up in the morning until you go to sleep, and even what you do while you're sleeping and how you sleep. And this, this is really the new paradigm of medicine, the, the quote unquote new medicine. And so the Dalai Lama and Herbert Benson, it's a really interesting mixture of, wor of worlds. We can actually, I think, send out a thanks to Richard Nixon, because he, he got us back involved with China and that opened up a lot of other areas in Asia and really facilitated a big exchange of ideas between Western scientists and people doing that weird, crazy, you know, Dalai Lama stuff. So Herbert Benson westernized transcendental meditation. Those of us who are old enough to have been pseudo-hippies or in the waning days of hippiedom, we've probably all been trained. We all got our mantra, right, and we were doing it, but now it was made palatable. So on I went to medical school still very steeped in science, but reading these subversive books and thinking these subversive ideas. Um, what does it all mean? What, is, what about human suffering? Um, you know, how can we maintain our humanity while we're learning not to be human? I love the fact that this whole series of talks is, based, is called Fearless, because from day one, you're taught to be afraid. I don't know a physician, except for maybe myself, who's not afraid. Almost every day when they go to work, they're afraid. That's me on the day I graduated from medical school. Um, yeah, I've changed a little bit since then. That was in 1989. Um, and then this is, a, this is what I looked like about six months later. <laughs> maybe two, two months later, I was a surgical resident at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh. Joan Borisenko, who is one of the godmothers of the mind-body medicine movement, came and spoke to us, the surgery residents. God knows why. And I, I very, it, it's pretty much like this. I remember walking out with all my compadres, and they were all just like, that was stupid. That was a waste of time. That woman is nuts. None of this really matters to our surgical patients. And, but I knew they were wrong, and that made it very hard for me to stay in surgery. I carried this book in my pocket of my long, white, spattered, nasty, God knows how many germ-ridden white coat every day of my internship in general surgery. And I read it, and it, is, it was my lifeline. It was what made it possible. I know many people who have found, through whatever they're going through, even if it's just the full catastrophe of being a human being, this book and the wisdom contained in it is so simple and direct to, it spoke so clearly to me. And so finding peace in my heart, I knew that I couldn't be a good physician unless I could somehow be present with the people I was caring for. And so I would sit, we would have a patient dying, you know, I, I would sit and hold that patient's hand until they were dead. And my colleagues really thought I was nuts. They called me Dr. Salad, and they called me Dr. Tofu. And, you know, she's, you know. So it really became clear after a while that surgery was not the, the, the place I wanted to be. What does Sigmund Freud have to do 
with all of this. This is, this is something that I learned because after I got out of surgery, I went into emergency medicine for four or five years because I wanted to stay in clinical medicine after all the years I'd put into it. But still, every time someone would come in, like some dude lit, you know, fired up his furnace for the winter, tur turns on the pilot light, but he's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Like, and of course, he gets his face blown off. I'm like, what were you thinking? Did, what, what was the thought? Or, you know, another dude comes in, he's been playing with his gun while he's drinking with his friends and blows off half of his... What, what was going through you? How did this happen? So my whole PhD dissertation was about what goes through people's minds right when a bad thing happens. And how does that affect their ability to make that, integrate that into their lives and grow from it? And I had this crazy idea that these pa our trauma patients and my ER patients, that it was an epiphany, you know. Getting hurt real bad, as we say, getting hurt bad, is like the door opening to a new life. Like, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm not gonna play with my guns while I'm drinking anymore. Just play with them sober, you know. <laughs> that, would, that would be a helpful step. But it turns out that Freud and all these old guys had a lot of understanding of trauma and traumatic incidents and, and then just general everyday stress that can help us and that could help people who would go through experiences like this, but also all the people taking care of them. I'm particularly conscious right now of the hazards being faced by our healthcare personnel with the Ebola outbreak. You know, the people who are, everybody's scared, right? But the people who are most vulnerable are the doctors and the nurses and the other uh, people in the hospital taking care of them. This is my mentor, the late Dr. Chris Peterson. I went to Michigan, my, my baby daddy, who's now a trauma surgeon here in Portland, um, he and I went to Michigan. I went there to get a PhD. He went there to get a fellowship in burn surgery so he could come here. And so he runs a program, a really great uh, re respiratory care and trauma program over at Emanuel Hospital. But Dr. Chris Peterson changed my life. And he is one of the um, originators of the idea of learned helplessness, where life just beats you down, it beats you down, it beats you down, and eventually people give up. And that shows up as post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, substance use, a variety of different outcomes. But you don't have to be clinically diagnosable to be affected by the bad things in life. And we all, as the Buddha says, you know, all life is suffering. And that's step one. That's the first thing. And we all figure that out at some time, usually around the time we're eight or nine years old. Like, holy crap, my parents are going to die. I'm going to die. My dog's going to die. Um, and then what? So where does the meaning come in? And, how to, and, and then when you spend time in critical care and emergency care and in working with traumatized people, meaning is so important. And so working with Chris on my dissertation work and also just being around him was incredibly uh, just very eye-opening and, and really a big growing experience for me. He is also one of the founders of positive psychology. You know, clinical medicine is all about stopping the bleeding, and getting your lab values normal. Like it, you're somewhere here, and ideally you're, and I hate this word, normal. How many here, people here just really want to be normal? I want to be better than normal. So I studied mind-body medicine. This is the crew. I just flew in yesterday from San Francisco where I was training with the other members of this organization, teaching people from all over the world. There were about 30 uh, veterans. I mean, we're talking fresh. They were on the battlefield within the last six months. And they were there learning how to do mind-body medicine for themselves and for their brothers and sisters. And then maybe 200 more other, all different types of people who want to learn how to facilitate healing within ourselves so that it can expand to the globe. In fact, our motto is training thousands to heal millions. And that's exactly what we're doing. So we all know that healthcare isn't working now, that other type of healthcare that we're talking about, the type of healthcare that gets done to us is not working. And the other thing that I really want you to know, and you may know this already, we already know everything we need to know. God love research, God love surgery. I mean, it's not surgery, science. We have to keep studying ourselves and learning to know ourselves better. But if we want to cut the prevalence of the chronic diseases that kill most of us eventually, we already know what to do, right? We need to just stay off our butts more. We need to eat better. We need to take better care of ourselves psychologically, spiritually, and emotionally. That's where mind-body medicine comes in. Because just feeling pressure to exercise and not knowing what to eat is not really going to cut it. So I just want to, there's a few basic principles. I only have five minutes left. Wow, that goes by fast. 
usually I have a whole hour. <laughs> Thoughts and feelings are physiology. And so those little cards that you got, some of you got the little plastic thing, it's basically like a mood ring. And stress, what stress does is it prepares you to be attacked. And even if you're thinking about traffic or you're in traffic, it's preparing you to be attacked and mauled by some huge predatory animal. So the blood tends to go away from, you know, cold, cold sweaty hands. When someone shakes your hand, you know they're anxious if their hand is cold and, and kind of clammy. So really, it's a simple uh, principle of changing your thoughts will affect the blood flow in your body. Don't have time to do it with you, but you can play with it. Count to 10 and think loving thoughts and see what happens to the color. Stress and trauma, they cause disease and they make it worse. And they make us miserable. And we have a lot of misery in this world. Anyone can learn how to generate health. It's not just us doctors and psychologists and experts that know how to be healthy. It's not up to us to tell everyone else how to be healthy. We need to share that wisdom and understanding and we need to heal ourselves and each other. Mindfulness is the key to what, everything we do. Paying attention, paying attention when you eat, when you make love, when you take a shower, when you give a talk. Couple more principles. There's no substitute for good nutrition, and it's really not as complicated as we think. Eat food, real food. That's, that, that's a good start for most of us. We need each other. We need to start thinking about how we connect with each other and, and treat each other. And, the, and when we feel lonely, we need to learn how to reach out and try to create community, even if it's with, with just one and one together. And finally, I'll just stop with this image because I think I'm out of time. It, health is, this is what I learned when I came to Portland State. School of Community Health? What, public health? I, I don't, you know, I'm a physiologist. What does that have to do with anything I know? But it, it, it really has opened my eyes and I'm a passionate advocate of not blaming people for getting sick because we don't understand the context, the history, and the resources that lead to illness in each individual person. What we need to do is focus on what we can do for, for each other and for ourselves. And think globally while we're also thinking very, very specifically about our own selves. And because the, each, each one of us, as we grow and develop and become more healthy and loving toward ourselves, that will create a better world. And then we can go to Mars and do all kinds of other cool stuff and draw pictures along the way. So thank you very much for your time.